Uh, my iPad is really slow today. Okay, I think we're good here. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, is everybody see it okay? Yep. Let me see. All right. Um, a little bit of history of myself here. I, I started fly fishing when I was 10 and started to tie flies when I was uh, 12. And I'm 75 now, so I've met it a while. And during that stretch, I've, and I tied commercially for some years uh, when you could still make a buck at it. And uh, so then I, I continue to, to collect tools and equipment and so on. So what you're going to see today is you're going to see a march through time. Oh, shoot. Now I went and did it wrong again. I, I, per, per, no. Bear in mind, I'm going to appear like an idiot on this. This is the first time I've ever done this. Okay. Now, this is the first slide. We're going to talk here about driving flying fly. And there's a bunch there on the right-hand side. And they're tied two different ways. The one in the bottom right corner, actually, uh, what they're used for is they're used for sinking line floating fly methods. And uh, the bottom right corner actually incorporates bubble wrap. And then it's got a dub body over the top, as you can see, and the back is actually covered with an alcohol pencil. Uh, the eyes are actually created using uh, a leather punch uh, and, and uh, foam or throngs that you, you punch the pieces out, then you time in for eyes of that type. The one on the bottom right-hand corner uh, is uh, is tied of uh, blanket material that you see often in hotels and stuff like that. Uh, that usually has a core and then it has fuzzy on both sides that makes a really nice shaped body and it holds together quite well. As you can see, the one in the very top uh, there is trimmed to shape, and you can see the the liner uh, in the one there in the top right. Anytime anybody has any questions, just build her forth here, folks. Uh, bead storage. Um, I use these containers. I get from Lee Valley. Uh, I find they work quite well. And uh, I use it. What they do is they got a little lousy catch on them. So each one of my containers is strapped together with an elastic band. Um, one of the issues is, is because I've been around for a lot of years, I dyed a lot of my own material. And at one time, the RIT and Tintex dye was available from virtually every grocery store. Uh, now with clothes being so cheap, people don't do it anymore, but occasionally you run into it. Certainly you can buy it online, it works quite well. The vineyard dyes, uh, they also work quite well. I've used them and got them in quite a selection of colors. This is the process I use. I use an old style wash basin. Uh, all of us have probably seen one of those. And, and I make sure I place as many sheets of newspaper between where I'm working and the sink. Now, if you drop any amount of that dye on, this, uh, on your cover tops, your wife is going to clean your ass out really bad. Uh, it, it stains and it'll stain forever. Uh, the way to do this is you actually dye, but if, I use about a half a teaspoon in a glass jar and, and mix it with warm water. Uh, then I add it to the about two inches of water in the basin that I brought to a, just about a steaming load. And I add two glops of household vinegar, and, and I belong to the glop series of measurement. When you hold the gallon jar over there, it goes glop, glop, you got enough vinegar. And uh, after you're done, what you figure you died enough, and I just check it with a set of forceps. I wash the material in, in warm soapy water or warm water, or rinse it in material, I should say, in warm water to rinse all the, the grease and stuff out. I add the material and stir it around, lift out it a little bit. And usually I hold it in over a plate or glass. I find glass containers work the best. And I flush it with cold water until it's done. If it's not quite done, I put it back in. There's something I missed here, and a friend of mine does this, is he has a whole bunch of old canning jars. And what he does is he often mixes various colors in. The, and what he does is he writes a masking tape on the outside of the canning jar of the mix he uses and puts the used dye material in the jar and he reuses it a number of times. On two questions. Shoot. When when you say vapor stage, you put that you put that wash basin on a hot plate or no, I use, no, no, I use it on the kitchen stove. Oh, just on the kitchen stove. Yeah, I see. Yeah, okay. And then what I do with Florin is I just bring it up to the point where it's not boiling, but you see the vapor coming on the top? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah and the second question is, have, have you ever tried uh, dyeing these materials cold, like soak them in the, in the dye solution for a long time and then do the same? I don't have the patience for that. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. The only one I've ever done like that is deer hair. And, and the only one I've done of deer hair like that is black. And black is a, part of my language is an SOB to dye. Uh, it wants to turn purple, it wants to turn brown, it wants to turn blue. It just hates turning black. So uh, often what you do know is you often have to leave that in there for a period of time. Uh, I find it just easier to buy blacks now than, than try to dye. That's your question. Any, any tips on dyeing polar bear? No. Okay. You know, one of the problems is there's so little polar bear, I don't have any experience at it. Uh, you know, I, there's certain there's folks out there in the BC land have done that. Uh, this is just one of the, the critters that occasionally fall to my flies. All right, uh, scudback. Um, a lot of people buy this prepared in packages and I build my own. And what I do is go down to the, the, the millinery shop and I go in there and they sell what they call bra elastic. And it comes in quarter and three eighths of an inch pieces or uh, width strips. And you can buy it by the yard. I usually buy 10 or 15 yards at a time. And then I cut a little cut into it about two inches long. I put it on each side of that razor blade and I just pull it in direction and I can cut basically 10 yards in a matter of about, well, probably 10 minutes. And another thing is that scudback dies very nicely with uh, those acid bat dyes I was using either either writ or, or the vineyard. It dies very nice and the, and the dye holes really, really well. Uh, the little tool in the bottom is made out of two pieces of uh, aluminum extrusion and uh, they're absolutely flat. And I just made them out and bolted it together to hold the razor blade. For those that, that still remember the good old days, if you want to buy decent razor blades, buy Wilkeson Sword. Uh, these double, these single-sided blades, unfortunately, the world has invented them. There's the only thing they're good for is removing paint off a of glass. I use the Wilkeson blades all the time for, for rod building. They don't fray. Now, macrame yarn. Um, for those that have never used it, um, it's a, probably the finest floating material I've ever run into. Uh, I used to use it for a fly called the CFF, uh, which was invented on the crow's nest. And it took two years to get its name. And the reason it did is because it caught 115 cutthroats on the same fly before one stole it. In a way, it needs to be combed out. And I found that these tools, the, the, the mustache comb works really well for the smaller mounts. For the larger amounts that a guy might use on pipe flies or something like that, I find that these dog brushes work quite well. Don, question. Yeah, shoot. Sorry to keep interrupting here. No, no, I've, no, no, I've, no I've got some macrame and I've, you know, I've unwound the whatever yeah. eight individual strands and then I, yeah. I, I took a brush and I did some brushing and it, it came out nice and fluffy like in your picture. Yeah. And then I tied some flies with it and they were the best wet flies I ever tied. None, none of them floated. Ah. What did I do wrong? A couple of things is, is when you tied them on, you made the material too tight. It has to, it has to hold air. All right. So what you do is that in the case of CFF, what I do is I tie the clump of macrame yarn in a use of the fly. Then I turn around and I thin it by going to the tail end and taking some of the material out to thin it out. All right, and then what I do before I use the fly, I put a very small amount of fly floating on that fly. Now, uh, it, will, <coughs> it will float, uh, I use it for strike indicators all the time as well. And it'll float, uh, let's say a size 12 medium weighted hook like real well. And it, like I use it for indicators and they'll float for 15 or 20 minutes without giving you a lick of problem. On my website, I've got an in, or, uh, uh, article there on how to tie macrame indicators. Uh, not only right, so for- dre Dressing them with floatant is, is important. It is important, yeah. Them out. yeah. Yeah, you bet, you bet. 
Okay. Okay, because I have some macrame that floats without anything. You just shake the water out of it. Yeah, and it you know, works quite well. Yeah. yeah. Now I I try two flies. The CFS is one of them. Uh, the other one is 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 called the the BM or ball movement, and and it's brown and and floats. So it's meant for a, a stonefly adult, and it works quite well. Anyway, bomb and threaders. Uh, they all break. Uh, usually, what happens is they break at the where the wire is there, where they bend over and you insert them in your in your bobbin to thread them. And if you pick up a very light guitar string, uh, you can turn on and re-solder it in there. That one's been done a couple of times. Now I tie some small flies. Uh, you can see over here the one on the left, the tiny weighted midge nymph. There's one turn of ten thousandths lead wire in that, and it's just enough to crack through the surface. And the h &L variant uh, is what I use on the, uh, the Livingston. I shouldn't tell as far in this, but there's often fish that are rising up there that are very difficult to catch. And this guy does it. And I'll just sit there and pick on a pot of fish all day until, until I chase them all down. Now, flash of If you take your scissors and go into the cop corner, in this case, you can see where the bodkin has. Uh, I just cut a little bit in there in a V, and so that I can fish out the number of strands of flash what I want with opening in the package. And they'll stay like that forever, and then I can hang them, and we'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay, dub and twisters. Uh, the one on the left here is a broken Griffiths hackle plier. I've taken, as you can see, the ring there which took the hackle plier used to be where the, the uh, dubbing or the hackle fire, what the quip was, the jaw broke off. So I took this crappy pair of sunrise hackle pliers and turned it into a twister. Now I just incorporated one to the other by opening the loop up. The red things at the end, for those that have never used it, uh, hackle pliers can be a pain in the butt. Uh, some of them cut and some of them are a pain. So that is actually shrink tape you buy for electrical wire. And you just shrink a little bit on there and your hackle, yeah. it grabs it really well, and it'll never slide on you. Uh, you know, on the right hand side I've is done a that series. To all my hackle players. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I've done that to all my hackle players. Yeah, it works out really, really well. Uh, the other thing is the typical dubbing twisters I've got on here, and there's a whole sack of them. The difference between the two of them is that the one on the left here, I do dubbing where I would take, for example, a hair's ear on a loop dub method, and I would add in a piece of copper wire all at the same time and twist them together and dub them together. The ball, the body then becomes bulletproof. In the same way when I'm doing hurl, I'll do hurl with a, with a loop tying it with this system here. The, the uh, CFF, for example, uses that for the body and the bodies will wear the hurl off before it comes apart. Uh, it's a good way of doing things, but yeah, you can pick up flashaboo or wire or dubbing loops, whatever you want with that system. With the other ones, well, not so much. Anyway, uh, this is the kind of trout I occasionally catch. Uh, that's probably about oh, five and a half or six pounds. <laughs> now that's it. That went from that lake was a medium sized trout. Uh, we would often catch them up to about seven or eight pounds. Now, I've yet tried various types of, of deer hair stackers. Um, frankly, I like the, the sunrise ones, which are the larger ones to the left. And at one point, uh, one of the suppliers of my, my uh, uh, snake guides, and guides I use on my bamboo rods, uh, is a company out of Britain. And I got this other one on the right from them. I was kind of concerned when it came because it's plastic. And, Plastic likes to set up uh, static electricity, but it, for those who have never done it, just to wipe down with a used bounce laundry cloth will kill that static great bang. Plus your hands smell really good. Uh, dying holders for flies. And I tie a bunch of uh, coronamids at a time. And so what I do is I'll treat them all at once. And I made up this, uh, this twister here out of a bunch of parts I had hanging around. The motor is a barbecue motor, and the rest of it's just stuff I called together a junk in the basement. Um, 
The wine on the, on the right hand side is made of uh, insulation material used for water lines for motor homes and so on. And I just cut a chunk off and I got a piece of plywood with a couple of cores on it and just a band-aid to hold it in place. The, the white material is actually magnetized uh, that stuff you get or used to get with the fly boxes and you can buy magnetized tape like that and it's blue on one side. I just rope it down. I can put my hooks on there and I know where they are that way. I don't chase around the tabletop. Now, UV resins and so on. If uh, I take these swimming pool noodle holders and, and I make up discs like this, I have about four or five on my tabletop <coughs> and I set the bottles in there and believe it or not, they sit there without dumping. So you don't end up with that resin, for example, I think it's about 20 bucks for that little bottle. It gets, a, oh, by the way, don't ever buy that stuff from China. I have about a six ounce supply I paid $5 for and it won't set. There's nothing you can do with it. <coughs> this stuff I use, the, the diamond resin, it works quite well. Um, then I have a series of UV lights and uh, the one on the very right is the most expensive. And a, one of the biggest problems when it uses the same battery that a flash system uses for a camera. Uh, the cheapest I found is $15. The purple one I got from Home Depot and it works the best of the other bunch. And it uses triple A's. I think it were 12 bucks when I bought the last one. Uh, and they're really, really, really good. For the price you pay, you can't miss. Uh, miscellaneous tools. Um, the half inch tool, I use a material for a bunch of things it's called UHMW, it's a high milli plastic. And uh, it makes really good all kinds of tools. I use it for, excuse me, I use it for uh, pulleys on my pontoon boat because the things slip like crazy. I use it on pulleys for my rod binder for bamboo because the glue doesn't stick to it. And it works quite well for building a bobbin or a- Yeah, yeah a, it's, a it's called tool. ultra high molecular weight plastic and it's Yeah, you bet, slippery. and there's a, the company, I, the company I get it from is it, it Johnson Plastics out of Edmonton. And the last time I bought it, uh, I asked them, they sold retail and they said, good. So I came with my saw and I just sawed off the chunks I wanted. So I have from half inch up to four inch in round stock. Uh, pliers, I use uh, small side cutters, you can see there. <coughs> I think they're Exolite, the ones that I have and the, and the, uh, the tweezers are the best one I ever had, I ever saw. What happens, you press it open and it closes. You don't have to hold it closed, so it works great for handling beads. Hi, Don, sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> um, the uh, half inch tool, the UM, uh, UHMW, uh, you can buy um, small batches. I think it's maybe three pounds worth of it uh, at uh, Lee Valley for, I think it used to be 10 bucks. I'm not yeah. sure if it still is. Yeah, the heck of it is it's all square stock. Yeah, there's and a plastics looked, place on Cloverdale that uh, sells, sells that sort of stuff too. Yeah, it's yeah, good. That's stuff. A, called industrial plastics that yep. store on Cloverdale. And what they use that UHMW uh, on the bottom of uh, jet boats. It, yep. uh, it, it just doesn't get bashed up, even bouncing over rocks. It's an amazing material, but it's kind of expensive. Yeah, it's also very slippery. That's why they use it. Uh, I've used it used it for bearings for telescope mounts, so it works good for some things. Well, yeah. in the in the job I had before, I was a foreman for a sulfur handling facility for one of the major gas plants, and our chutes and and some of the equipment was lined with that stuff. And we used to buy sheets of four by twelve by by a quarter inch, and and it went inside the uh, the bins and so on. And the problem is all the, the skating clubs, the hockey clubs locally wanted it because it worked really well for practicing their slap shots. So they could practice slap shots all summer by using this stuff. So there was a lot of it. It's still hanging around town, I'm sure. Like there were sheets made out of there. Like I used to donate them all the time. Uh, the oil company didn't care. We did stuff for, for the local club. Anyway, this is a size 14 caddis. I made a macrame yarn and covered it with a magic marker. And, and uh, it, it floats like a top. And for those that have never lived with stillwater fish, the best stillwater fly I've ever seen in my life is called the catatonic leech. And the catatonic tells you how, how it's supposed to be fished. 
and it's made basically of all of marabou. And uh, we had a day on that lake where you saw that previous fish out there that I estimate the four of us landed a thousand pounds of trout on those things. And I know that's hard to believe, but it was incredible. Anyway, plastic sheets. Uh, we all use them uh, for any static bag and things of the nature. I cut them on a sheet of, of glass and with an engineer's rule and a sharp knife. And I hold the rule in place with a knife or with a clamp, uh, one of those quick clamps, and I can cut a whole bunch of it in, in a hurry. Now, Florin mentioned my friend Michael Dell earlier. Uh, there's a story here. Michael and I, we occasionally fish small jigs, and we have to get them exactly the right weight. And Mike had me going by one of the hash stores in Edmonton, the head shop, and see that in the shop. So he come home and he, look what I got when he showed me the next time I'm fishing. So I use these hash scales for uh, not only weighing flies to get them the right weight, but also when I'm mixing the, uh, the glues up for my bamboo rod operation, they're used for that as well. I have a couple <laughs> of them. You never know what you might find. Anyway, progression of scissors over 65 years. Uh, way back when, the scissors of, of, that were available the, on the far left was embroidery scissors. And, and that's where I got them. Then I realized quite quickly, if you were going to get faster, you had to not pick the scissors up and put them down all the time. So I cut one of the finger holes off and moved it up and, and basically brazed it in place. And that's section number two. Now, of course, over time, I decided to get better ones. And that's the the curved body one, which is number three. Then I got a little better quality one, which is number four. And again, I cut the thing off. And in that case, I super glued it on because I, I filed them flat and super glued them in place. Number five is a pair of iris scissors. And they're shown in the top uh, right column. And that pair of scissors cost me 40 bucks in 1973. Now they're probably about three or $400 now but you can cut an eyelash longitudinally. Like they are quite incredible. And then I ran into these guys with the finger holes actually offset and they're produced by a company called Anvil out of the States. And I happened to run into the first set, the light blue ones, I used them for years. I sharpened them myself uh, using uh, an 8,000 uh, wet dry stone and uh, water, Japanese water stone. And uh, the darker blue ones, the ones I got now, and when I ran into them the last time, I bought four pairs because I found out in life, if you find something good, buy enough that you're going to use a lifetime supply because some will for sure will get rid of them. Anyway, and then the bottom right corner is ones with curved jaws on them. Uh, you can see that there's a red jaw in there to protect the tips there. And there's a little piece of white or a clear gray tape on the top one. And they go on the points of the, of the very expensive scissors to protect them from being dropped and beat up on. This is my fly tying station. Now, this as uh, the picture on the left shows the left side of the station. The picture on the right is the, the center of the station. And I mentioned to you these, these little jars, a little uh, 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 pool noodles for my race materials. Uh, like a lot of guys, I'm going blind, so I have to use them. You can see where the, everything is set up for speed. Eh? Like when I was tying commercially, you either got fast or you went nuts. All right. Uh, this gives you an idea of the station. And my, my library is over there on the, on the left hand or the right hand one. Uh, the material storage is in those either in the, the drawers or in the case of the thing here on the left hand side, you can see there's a bunch of plastic boxes underneath there. That's all full of capes and hair and all kinds of stuff. All right. Uh, one of the things I found is that trying to sort through materials, um, the Ziploc bags work really well, but how to deal with it. Uh, if you took a look at the picture here in the top, basically the top center, you'll see uh, there's a dowel. And that's a, a, a chunk of one inch dowel. It's supported off a, uh, of a, a basically a shelf bracket with a screw in the top. And, and then on the table bottom, there's another screw in a washer. And then what I did, and you can see there's places where the bags are held on there. And what I did is bought a bunch of welding or brazing rod. And I, and I drilled holes in there at 90 degrees from each other and I pushed the rod through and uh, bent the ends of it like that. And it'll hold all kinds of uh, Ziploc bags. And you can rotate the thing around to pick it up. 
In my case, the one on the left holds synthetics and the one on the right holds natural. Now, this is my primary vice I use now. I, like I've gone through a series of vices starting back with a herder's vice my mother bought for me, I think in about 19, probably about 1960, maybe 57, I, that, I wore it out funny. Uh, and then I stepped through a whole bunch, I finally ended up with a Thompson A that I shipped out to the school kids out in uh, BC. Anyway, uh, this is the one I use now primarily. It's a, it's a uh, Barracuda, Dinah King Barracuda. Uh, one of the things I failings I found with <laughs> Barracuda is that the head was, was quite heavy and it wanted to be always down. So what I did is I made a counterweight of nickel silver and I rotated it to 180 degrees to the head and the tension screw that's on there now basically is barely touched. I can rotate that thing around just by just barely touching it. The rod that's in there that they provide with their goofy little bobbin holder uh, is just a pain in the ass because it's too small. So I curved one out of that uh, I'm electric plastic and I put it on a 1 8 stainless steel welding rod that I whaled the flux off and polished. Works like a hot dam. Anyway, the uh, now in front of here, uh, you'll see I got a gray table. Uh, this is what happens when you steal from the dog. Uh, that's the dog table that's used to keep the dog plate on there. So we can slot food and there's a turned up edge on it. Plus it's made of some kind of a, a rubber synthetic material. It's soft as sex, things don't roll off, beads don't roll off and all that good stuff. It's really easy to work with. Uh, what you don't see is this gray thing right in the very bottom is actually a tray. So when I'm trimming deer hair that goes into the tray and then the tray goes into the trash can. So I don't have to have deer hair all over the table. Now, bobbin cradles, they, this is the one I used for about 35 years. It's made out of a coat hanger. And, and for those guys that remember, uh, Field and Stream many, many, many years ago had a thing called Tapley's Tips. And this is one of Tapley's Tips. And it was how to make a bobbin holder out of a clothes hanger. And it worked like a hot dam and it's been around for many, many years. And if you take your bottom and just tap with your finger, it rotates on the bottom. I just wrapped a coasting around the 3 8 shaft and it works like a dam. Matter only hip fin whip finishers. Now, what I've done in the left one, you can see there's a little silver collar and that's a little piece of aluminum. And all that it does is lift that bobbin hole or that, that you know, whip finisher just far enough off the table, you can actually pick it up readily just saves a little bit of time. And of course, folks don't realize, but they also build one in, in a larger length. Works really great for putting knots in the center of the hooks. This was an ugly story that got better. Um, I'm left-handed. And as I exclamation says, the Thompson whip finisher that came originally didn't look like this. So what I did is I, I tried it and I could not figure out how to use it. And I used to finish all my flies off with a, with a half hitch and, and, uh, and then finally doing a whip finish by hand. And I, but I couldn't figure out how to use this tool. And I realized the little curvy part in the end was built for right-handers. So what I did is I heated it up over the stove and bent it the other direction. And now it works for left-handed worlds. Uh, being left-handed at that point on the right-handed world ain't easy. Uh, for some reason, you guys won't drive me on, let me drive on the proper side of the road. Now, this is some of the ideas of some of the fish I caught. Um, the one here was taken on in Southeast BC on a leech pattern. She was about six pounds. And, and the, the pike that you see over there was caught at Cully. And I, the flies I used for Cully, and I haven't done that, maybe at one point in time, I'll go into flies that, that are made out of various things. That was made out of uh, Halloween mass I used, caught that fly on. Anyway, hook boxes. Um, what I do is I take the hook descriptions and if I can get it and I cut them off and I put them in the bottom of the box so I can turn it over and find out where the damn flies are. These are the ones I use when I'm, when I'm traveling so that uh, they hold a whole bunch of flies or fly hooks. So when I'm around and I have, th I think four of them now. Uh, B 
bead blanket. For those that have never dropped a bead, these work really well. Uh, they hold the beads, you can work on there, they'll drop in there and sit there. And Togan's Fly Shop is a really neat fly shop in BC. They got a whole bunch of various stuff and they have a website. Now, this is a story. We have a reel on the left-hand side there. And it's a clicker. It's patterned after the Hardys. It actually clicks. It actually has a line on it. A friend of mine who unfortunately passed away of pancreatic cancer built that for me as well as he built the right hand, the vice on the right hand side. And the vice actually has a, a tool steel jaws. It's actually it can be used. Uh, it's unfortunately it's meant for little tiny flies that I don't use 28s very often. Unfortunately, Brian, when I said passed away, uh, he used to build model engines, uh, traction engines, uh, gasoline driven. And he, he would bring them out when we fished the crow's nest together many years ago. And uh, these things were built to scale. Uh, what the only thing not to scale was the, uh, was some of the electric components. Uh, and uh, I always remember him showing me a spark plug that was about <coughs> three quarters of an inch long and about an eighth of an inch diameter. And, and I asked him how he built it. And he said, well, I machined the metal out. Okay, that makes sense. And then to build the insulator, it was build a UMHW and use a, a stainless uh, piece of uh, a wire, Monel wire. He actually drilled through the center of the, of the UMHW to build the electrode for it. Uh, one of the things that always did drive me nuts is how you would build, uh, you know, things like uh, piston rings. And he said, well, the model engine guys are cunning as well and crazy as some of the bamboo rod builders and all. And the piston rings were actually built out of space shuttle tiles that one of the guys had worked uh, on space shuttles and he had acquired a bunch of these tiles that have to be perfectly fit and the rejects were filed in the back 40. And the guy would go back to get them and Brian used to precision grind them as, uh, as uh, piston rods for his pistons. Eh? Anyway, rotating hackle or rotating head cutters and hackle pliers. Um, the top one, unfortunately, is a really good idea and it doesn't work where they shit. It leaves a ridge on the end of the plastic sheets. And we have three other types of hackle pliers there. Uh, the one, the yellow bodied ones, if you want to spend enough time with a piece of material, you can actually get them to the smooth. Uh, the one on the bottom was one from the English fly shop. I, Hopkins and Holloway is who they are out of Britain, and, but they don't sell the tools anymore, unfortunately. But it didn't work with a dam until they put a piece of that uh, shrink tube on it. Drumming storage. Now, those that travel as I do for fly fishing, uh, well, you need somewhere to keep your dubbing and these plastic uh, drinking straws work really well. I cut them in thirds and you just stuff the dubbing up there and pull out what you need. On a bigger volume, you can use the plastic box that are shown on the, on the right side slide here. Just drill a hole in it and you can pile them full of plastic. Take your bodkin and you can just pop out what you need. And this is a typical coronamus sample. Now, what's most appropriate to see here is the size of the coronamids. Now, I have a heck of a time sometimes looking at these little vials that everybody packs around. So I use a camera and this is a little plastic dish. And what I did is I glued a size 14 TMC size 100 model 100 hook in there with epoxy so that you had some reference to size of what kind of coronamids you were tying. And this is one of my, my uh, calipers. And to give you an idea, it's open at 204 thousandths. That's the length of that book. So it's under a quarter inch is what that body is on that chronomet. And they de catch decent trout. This was taken on my pond, out of my pontoon boat. Uh, that one on the left there is probably about three pounds and the other one I raised is maybe five. Now, for those that that do a lot of, of, of the play time, uh, as I did, what I used to do is I looked around for the appropriate type of material. Uh, one of the problems that I'm gonna, the next slide will show you what I'm talking about. But this is what the hide looks like. And what you do is you, you place it. I used to work off the deep freeze and I placed the deep freeze and I flesh it and peel off all of it and then put it on a piece of uh, four inch sheet of, of, uh, of half inch plywood. 
nail it down with, with small uh, finishing nails and cover it with borax. I used to pick it up at the local drugstore. A couple of days later, break it up. And, and, and then after it had dried for a week or so, and you'll see there's the solid lines on there. It's really important where you cut this stuff. So you cut a line down the center, which is the center of the back, and then you cut these next two lines, and then you cut those respective long pieces into about uh, six inch long pieces or eight inch long pieces. Now, why it's important, in, in, the borax will make this hide stiffer than hell, which means it'll lay on your tabletop without moving around. The second thing is that you can see the way it is, the back hair lies and it'll slope from front to back, from the head to the tail. And as you look at the stuff on the, that the, between the two black lines, it will tend to slope over towards the belly. So it's important that you pack them individually. When you cut them up in sectionally, what I used to do is I would take and I use a dog brush and I'd brush all the leaves and dirt and all that stuff out of it. And then I'd pack them in actually bread bags. And I would pack up basically get a whole deer hide in a bread bag. It's critical when you get these deer, what time of the year you get them. All right. Now, one of the things I talked about earlier is I tied flies commercially, which means everything counts for time. If you notice the hair on the left hand side, it has virtually no under fur. So when you pick it up, you pick it on that, you take your body, can you pop it up, you cut it to length. That hide, it looks like it's shaved, eh? Because it's laying flat on. I don't want it to chase around it like it's, if it's done on a piece or a tan, you chase around the tabletop trying to catch up to it. If this stuff here is on that kind of thing, you don't have to do that. And you just pick it up. Now, the needle there is built out of a sailor maker's needle that you buy those packages of needle. It's actually curved. And at the very end, I bent the very tip of it, the last 20 thousandths, into a small tip so the hair can't slide off. So you pick up what you need, you chip, trim it off, you take your, and I used to use a toothbrush, and you run your toothbrush through there, knock off whatever it is, and tie it on the hook, or cut it to length that you need it. You didn't have to stack or anything. Now you can see here, the one on the right though, is a different color and a different thickness used for a different purpose. The one on the left works really well when you're gonna do, as Dennis is in a few minutes here, He's going to do hair stacking. The one on the right doesn't work quite so well, works really well for humpies. Now, the one on the top, again, is a different color. No, so what I used and what I would find is the very best deer came in the first week or two of the season. And anybody that had a deer hide, they'd phone me, I'd come look at it, and if there was a good one, you got a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of rum, depending on your druthers, for the hide, and I'd take it home and clean it up because I wanted it with no underfur. And I had elk the same way, but it's got to be got in the first, the first several days of the season. Or if you're really brave, if you see one in a ditch earlier than that, you want to drive down and drive over it. It works really good to pick up deer hair that way. Uh, and after they're dead, the Fish and Wildlife Department don't much care. You need a permit to get it out of the ditch, but it works really well. All right. Uh, bass and pike uh, poppers. Now, these are what I used in BC, and I used them, made them out of, of beach thongs. Uh, and what I found places like Walmart and Superstore sell them about 88 cent a pair in the fall. So you, you take your chunk of rectangle, you cut it in, you glue it in place with goop, you cramp the thing with a, uh, with a uh, clothes peg, you take the clothes peg off after it's been there several days and the glue is dry, let it expand, and then basically using your bench grinder, you could grind them to shape. And they work really well for bass. And then, of course, if you're really adventurous, you glue two of them. And you can see the glue line. This is one done for, for pike. And I've got, and there, you can see the glue line where I've actually glued two of them together. You thread your, uh, your uh, rubber legs through there with a needle and put a little super glue in place to hold them in place. <coughs> Excuse me. No, fly cream. <laughs> For those that are ever used flag creams, you can buy gink, or and this stuff looks like gink and it smells like gink. And it's called Abilene and it's sold in the States for, as you can see, 12 ounces. I think I paid five bucks for that. You got a lifetime supply for you and all your buddies for $5. <coughs> now, 
all of us have problems and with that little piece of hide between your thumb and your finger that your thread slides through when your time flies. Now a fingernail buff of that type works really well. Now you can buy them from whatever supply store. Uh, the ladies down here at London Drugs like to see me show up and they smell better than any fly tire supplier I ever I looked at. And so I take them there and I borrow or buy all kinds of stuff. And this is a, a, a fingernail buff. Or you make your own. That's a chunk of, uh, of a three quarter or 400 grit sandpaper on a block of wood. Hockey sticks work really well for that if you can still find them. All right. And for the world's finest hand treatment, that's Corn Hopter's lotion. And you're going to only get it in the States. And if you look for it, you're going to have to look on the bottom shelf because it doesn't pay the same amount of money that the real expensive lotions pay to be on the top shelf. The last time Sandy and I were down in uh, Great Falls, we cleaned out all the stores down there. And we had, I think, 14 or 16 bottles of this when we got to the uh, to customs. And thank God the guy didn't ask us what we had bought, because I can't imagine what he would have done. <laughs> Take a look at that and open every jar to see where the drugs were. Anyway, this is one of the neatest stunts I ever saw in my life. Um, crazy glue uh, doesn't like to get hard if it's out in a bunch of small drops. Like if you put about six or eight drops on some kind of a container, in this case, it's just on a plastic lid that you get in a fly shop to put flies in. I buy those by the, by the uh, 50 watt units. So, you know, the, to mix glues in and stuff like that. And what you do is you put it there and you use a flat toothpick to apply it to your, to your flies. The crazy glue will not get hard for probably an hour. So you can take a little bit on your, as you're doing flies and you got a trouble spot, you want to point it ahead, you want to coat your body, take a little bit with a flat toothpick, toothpick and put it on there. And the crazy glue, good stuff. I, like I buy it at the dollar store here for four bucks a tube. I learned it from a guy in Edmonton was up for their, for fly tying display. Uh, this is some of the flies I tie. These are called boobies. Uh, I buy the material from, uh, from England, from the eye material. The stuff, the uh, scraggle yard and all that comes from wherever I can find it. They work really well on sinking lines. I use typically either a four or six. I fish them in relatively shallow water, like four foot of water on a four foot leader and I catch some really nice fish. This is one of my named. Uh, this is called Madonna. And you can see why she's like a white, she's a virgin. And I have caught a pile of fish on that gal. Yeah. As you see, I use barbless. Now, any ideas what that is? You only have to be around for 50 years to figure it out. It's a cutter of some kind. Yes, it is, kinda. Uh, that tool was invented by uh, George Zonker's Leonard. cutter. No, it was invented by a guy called George Leonard Herder, who was the basically the forerunner of uh, Cabela's and Bass Pro and the big sport shops. And George Leonard Herder used to produce a catalog of about an inch thick, size of a phone book. Now, what this was, you took a primary flight feather out of a duck and you put it in where you wanted it. And you see, there's a little cut in there in the just towards about a quarter inch in off the aluminum. You put it in there, clamped it down with the wire. Then you took the cutters and it divided each of the wings up left and right into individual wings for tying upright uh, uh, mallard flight feathers on for, hack, or for wing material. And they come in three separate sizes depending on what size of flies you were tying. And I tried it. Uh, it you know, what you do is use a little bit of glue on those as you put them together. And, and it holds the shape so you can just make up a whole bunch at one time for time commercially. It was a hell of an idea. Frankly, didn't work really well. Hey, Don, I've still got a Hooters catalog. Good for you. I haven't, for those that are interested, Herders also used to write books. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course they had, I bought the ones on fly tying and rod building. The ones I missed out are the ones that how to live on $5 a day. And the one I would really like to get is how to live with a bitch. Not that I do, but I thought it'd be great advice in for old guys. 
Uh, he also sold this this hand vise, as you can see here, and it actually worked. It actually does hold hooks. Yeah. All right. Now, for strengthening feathers that we use, uh, for example, the guys that use down wings for tying hopper patterns, this LePage's flexible cement works really well, and I just put it on with a bodkin. Um, earlier on, Florin asked about glues I use. A mixed shoe glue with lacquer thinner in one of these bottles for it to, to get your hackle to stay exactly where you want or the macrame yard to stay exactly where you want. Um, and I use that for years and years and years for tying really, really, really small flies. I would just put a drop on the bodkin and touch on the edge of a hackle and would go right to the root of a parachute fly. Now, for those that have never done it, uh, to take and, and take the, the uh, fronds off a, uh, a peacock curl for tying, you know, that type of flies. I used it for chronomids quite a bit. I used an art gum eraser and I just hold it down with a tip and basically erase the material. And it works quite well. You got to clean it every now and again on the eraser though, mind you. Now here's a series of, of the uh, of various types of scissors I've used. The one on the very top there I find great. And again, you press it, open it, so you put it on, a, you reach in and grab a bead, and then you can put it on the hook and drop it in. I actually found the one on the left there and I ground the, 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 uh, the uh, points to shape. The other ones are just straight. This thing on the second one with the piece of plastic on it was sold as a bead holder. And, and it, I still got it, but it's a piece of crap. Uh, and lubricate your, your jaws and your vice every now and again. I use three in one oil or gun oil. Um, and wipe it off, like just put a tiny little bit on your finger and wipe it on the bearing surface and wipe it off so you don't get, uh, you don't get oil on your feathers and stuff. And the other thing, if you use uh, to strengthen feathers, I use this stuff called Tulp Film from Good Biker. You buy it at art stores and it works really well if you're doing a whole bunch of feathers for doing, like pheasant feathers for doing uh, hoppers and things of that nature. Now, and this is the kind of fish you can catch on flies like that. Uh, this this female brown was 27 inches long, and I estimate close to seven pounds. And that ends my story, guys. Uh, is there any question of what you saw other than what Florin is? Like I said, I walked through them fairly quickly. I have no problem. I can go back if you wish. You know, the, the bobbin threader you showed us earlier? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember it might have been Mike Dell who who came up with this to the club, but he said, you know, these this dental floss threaders. Yep. Yeah. You can hardly see it. It's uh, they're you know they're disposable. I mean, if one breaks, you just pick up a new one. Yeah, but another one. Over years, I hardly, I hardly broke one. Um, and I one day I was I was cleaning up some junk, and I found some. Um, nerf darts so i took the um you know the sticky end thing and i just i just put in i can protect all my scissors well this is a good idea just like this yeah good and idea. for the for the beads not to roll actually you can buy these um at the craft stores they're called beading mats but they're just basically like a fabric like a fuzzy fabric almost like that blanket material that you yeah. use for um for the dragonflies and recently i spent a lot of time watching uh norm norlander tie flies on his rotary vice and one of the hints he gave there is just use an old towel yeah. as a as a surface to kind of keep your materials, not just beads, but everything from, from blowing away. And after using something sort of similar, I, I totally believe him. I haven't tried with an actual towel yet. I don't want to get in trouble too much, but um, yeah. Don, Don, you want to stop, <coughs> stop your screen share? Yeah, you betcha. Gotcha. There you go. <coughs> Good. Uh, so, Dennis, here. Uh, a, a quick comment on uh, containers. I was in St. Michael's uh, craft store a couple of years ago, and I made a complete conversion uh, to containers for hooks and beads 
uh, I guess the bead people use these. So if you drop the container, you don't drop 10,000 beads. You only drop a hundred. So that's worked out for me with beads and hooks. Uh, and one other comment about the UV glue, I use uh, actually tin foil, so it won't absorb. And you can put it under the vise, so you're not dripping it all over the place when you're coating the fly. Dennis here, I've got a question. What kind of lighting do you use when you're tying flies? In my case, what I've got is I have a fluorescent uh, but it's bought a 10 incher and and uh, and that's right directly above the vice and then in the roof itself when I built the room I put a bunch of fluorescent tubes up on top and I use these sunlight tubes and okay. yeah in the one that I think I don't recall which slide it was but I showed the uh the lamp there and uh it actually it allows me to rotate that and i wrap rods on that longer side of that same table uh, when i built the, the room what i was looking for is a tabletop that was about 16 feet long because i wanted to wrap rods i wanted to tie flies and at one time i used to reload shotgun shells on there as well so it was a multi-purpose room thank you thanks a lot don yeah, we're we're we're, we're, we're now at eleven o'clock, and uh, that's usually yeah. Thanks, Don. Quits. So I'm thinking maybe I'll postpone doing the uh, uh, irresistible until next week. Yep. And uh, maybe Florin can come up with a second fly, and we'll do two flies next week instead of uh, this week. Sounds like a good Sounds idea. Good. Yep. Yeah, I got no problem. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for being my first victims on this presentation. I'd never done this before. So, <laughs> that, that, you know, that's good. It, I hope it worked out okay. There it was, it was great, Don. Thanks. thanks. There was, I, have a, I have a list of things written down. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> hey, I, like, I, like, I like to take notes because my memory is not, not very good, you know? <laughs> One of the sure. things you missed, Florin, earlier on by arriving late. I had to go to the market, and I'm sure you guys had excuses are fine. This is the this is the keel hook I was talking about last week. Uh, where's my? There it is. I'm gonna. Oh, hold okay. It down. All right. You see where it's it's weighted in the bottom, and it actually you know, slides. I used to use them on Gold Lake for pike all the time, mm -hmm. and I have them both in stainless and mild steel. Anyway, enough is enough. You guys thanks, have thanks. a good day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Go on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.